Hi guys, Action 007 Cinema here. Warning, spoilers ahead. Today, I'm going to recap an American drama and action movie released in 2009 called Law Abiding Citizen. The movie is about a man who feels wronged by the justice system for the murder of his wife and daughter. Ten years later, he wants to teach them a lesson. How will he do it? Let's find out together. Klein Shelton is a suburban Philadelphia husband with a daughter. One night, he is busy tinkering with electronics as his daughter makes him a bracelet until someone knocks on their front door. Clyde opens the door, only to find a couple of house burglars, Clarence Darby and his friend. They attack him and barge into the house. Clyde lies helplessly while witnessing Darby attack his family, leaving him emotionally scarred for life. He lost both of them in that incident. A few months later, Nick Rice, an ace prosecutor in Philadelphia District Attorney's Office, is assigned to handle the case of Clyde's wife and daughter's murders. Nick dismissed the caution of his superior, Jomas Cantrell, to approach his decision on the case better, as he only cares about maintaining his high conviction rate. Nick believes that the American justice system is broken, and his role is only to serve in the best interest of his cases. Apparently, he has secured cooperation from Darby to confess his third-degree murder and testify against his partner as the rapist and planner. This deal means that Darby only gets five years of jail, while Darby's partner gets the death penalty. Hearing this, Clyde, who approaches Nick with more forensic evidence, is very upset. But Nick insists that they can lose in court, and both Darby and his partner would go free, so this is the best way to make sure they get some justice. Ten years later, the death sentence for Darby's partner is to be held at Philadelphia prison. Nick chooses to witness the execution instead of her 10-year-old daughter's cello performance with his junior DA Sarah Lowell among many other witnesses. For his last words, the partner insists that he is not the killer and that they're executing the wrong person. Shockingly, the execution by lethal injection that is supposedly painless turned out to be excruciating for him. Right after, an investigation has started on the unethical murder. Initially, the inspector found that someone had altered the chemical used in the execution, changing it into neurotoxin. Nick is inspecting the label when he discovers that it was scratched by words saying can't bite fate, which pinpoints Darby. Immediately, Nick and Detective Dunnigan from the FBI are racing to Darby's house. Meanwhile, Darby is watching the news about his partner's painful execution when an unknown number calls his cell phone and warns him about the police. Panicking, Darby escapes his house, right when the police are arriving. He starts shooting them, but the unknown caller tells him to toss his gun, guiding him to flee across the rooftop, as the caller had tasered an officer unconscious in a police car nearby. Darby enters the police car and grabs the officer's gun, forcing the unconscious officer to drive him into a remote location in upstate Philadelphia, following the unknown caller's advice. Upon arriving, he forces the officer to exit the car at gunpoint, as he is about to shoot him from behind, but the cell phone ring stops him, only to find that the officer is his unknown savior. Moreover, it is actually Clyde who proceeds to unmask himself. Darby reacts by pulling the trigger, only to realize that it is a blank gun. It has needles laced with tetrodotoxin on the handle, stinging Darby and paralyzing him but leaving him still conscious. Later on, Clyde is dragging Darby into a nearby warehouse where he's putting him into a restraining bed, prepping him to be still conscious for his next act. Clyde then slowly tortures Darby while also recording everything. Clyde quotes Darby from 10 years ago, you can't fight fate, as he proceeds to dismember Darby. The following day, Detective Dunnigan managed to locate Darby in the warehouse, calling Nick about it. Meanwhile, Sarah then informs Nick and Jonas of some information about Clyde, their primary suspect, and his past 10 years in the DA office. Nick believes there is more to it, and he is asking Sarah to dig deeper. At his country house, Clyde is busy tinkering, while incoming police sirens are wailing in the distance. He then undresses and waits patiently as the SWAT team storms his door, surrendering without resistance. While Dunnigan and Nick search Clyde's house, Nick finds a newspaper clipping from 10 years ago with him and Darby handshaking in front of the courthouse. He thinks Clyde must want revenge for their deal 10 years ago. In the interrogation room, 
Clyde waits calmly for Nick to come in. Nick then enters the room and quickly disables the CCTV camera, speaking closely to Clyde and privately congratulating him for removing a scum like Darby from this world. Then, he goes back to his official business, fishing for a confession which Clyde seems to give easily, though it turns out to be inconclusive and can't be used in court, just like in his case 10 years ago. He wants Nick to make a deal with him for a mattress in exchange for a confession, to make another deal with the murderer, like he did with Darby. In the following weeks, at his hearing, Clyde demonstrates his mastery of law by citing similar proceedings and asking for bail. The judge initially agreed with the motion, only to receive mockery from Clyde himself about her decision to let a murderer leave on bail, just like she did to Darby. Not long after, Clyde receives his mattress and confesses the murder of Darby and his partner. However, he's not finished as he asks for another deal in exchange for the life of Darby's attorney, who was reported missing three days ago. Clyde only wants some steak lunch from Del Frisco and his iPod for music, and all should be delivered at exactly 1 p.m. While delivering the deal, the warden insists on hindering the security checking just to make Clyde wait a bit, despite Nick's complaint. The delivery is eight minutes late, but Clyde still gives the exact coordinates where they immediately fly and dig up the attorney's body. He was kept in a box with some oxygen supply that would last just in time for them to come, if only they weren't late on delivering Clyde's lunch. In prison, Clyde offers his threatening summing his lunch before murdering him in cold blood using the steak's bone. This incident sends him into an isolation cell. Meanwhile, Sarah manages to find Clyde's previous contract with the Department of Defense and informs Nick about the finding. Later, Jonas introduces Nick to a CIA operative who used to work with Clyde. They learn that Clyde was a tactician in several projects for the U.S. government, specializing in finding ways to kill someone that seems impossible. The agent told both men to assume that Clyde is always planning and is in jail because he wants to be, as it's merely a game of chess for Clyde. Knowing this, Nick and Jonas urged the judge to dismiss Clyde's human rights by keeping him in a solitary cell longer than it should be. She agrees on the idea, and as she signs the paper, an incoming call rings her phone. She picks up the phone and it blows up on her face, killing her instantly as both Nick and Jonas watch in horror. Afterwards, Nick confronts Clyde and accuses him of revenge, but Clyde reasons that he's only demonstrating the justice system's failure. On that note, Clyde asks Nick to drop all charges against him and release him before 6 a.m. tomorrow, or else he will kill everyone related to his case. Then, Nick instructs the DA office's staff to move and work in the prison to find something against Clyde, while he is put under armed supervision. Nick and Sarah spent the night discussing their purpose and how to live with their decision at the court. At 6 a.m., nothing happens, so Nick, who feels that all is safe, sends everyone home to rest. As Nick and Jones discuss things in the parking lot, all of the staff's cars are exploding, including Sarah's. With Clyde still under armed supervision, Nick suggests that he must have an accomplice from the outside. The murder sent the mayor of Philadelphia into a spiraling frustration, so she summons Nick and Jonas to her office, telling them to fix the problem with Clyde immediately. At Sarah's funeral, Nick and Jonas contemplate how they brought everything into this mess, but Nick disagrees, as he thinks it's his fault. As the funeral ends, both men are escorted out of the cemetery in a few cars, while an unknown person is powering a remote-controlled army drone equipped with anti-tank bullets. Jonas is killed after a series of shots, followed by a rocket that explodes his car. With the death of Jonas, the grieving mayor appoints Nick as the new head district attorney of Philadelphia. As Nick goes through Sarah's research in the office, he finds a list of industrial buildings purchased by Clyde. Nick runs the information to Dunnigan to match Clyde's asset purchase and the public record. They then locate and break into a small unused garage next to the prison that Clyde owns. Inside, they discover a railroad tunnel system leading to the secret door under the closet of the solitary confinement cells. Also, they found the drone that Clyde used in the attack at Sarah's funeral and a large supply of weapons and Sentex explosives. They understand now that Clyde is working alone, and the tunnels enable him to perform all his kills despite many believing he is inside. 
Dunnigan carefully opens the secret door that leads into Clyde's cell, only to find it empty. From the stuff they found there, they find out that Clyde is planning to attack City Hall, which will be holding a meeting for Philadelphia officials tonight. At the City Hall, disguised as a janitor, Clyde easily bypasses the security and strategically plants a phone-activated napalm bomb hidden inside his equipment. He plans to kill the mayor and officials at their meeting. Nick, Dunnigan, and another detective infiltrate the city hall and found the bomb inside a suitcase directly below the meeting room's floor. While Clyde exits the building, the other detective tries to disarm the bomb but is unsuccessful and warns them to leave it at that. The three men then decide not to tell the mayor about it because they assume that Clyde is watching them and will detonate the bomb at any sign of detection. On the other hand, Clyde managed to return to his solitary cell through the underground tunnel, only to find Nick waiting for him. Both men talk about their philosophical beliefs for the last time, as Nick quoted the late Jonas on living with the decision they've made. Clyde mocks Nick by assuming he will make another offer, one last to deal. But Nick says he does not make deals with killers anymore, which he says he learned from Clyde's action. Clyde happily acknowledges that finally, he thinks that Nick has learned his lessons. Then, Nick tells Clyde that if he detonates the bomb, it will be a decision he has to live with for the rest of his life. As his wife and daughter are long dead, he feels that he has nothing left to live for. Clyde apologizes for his actions, and Nick replies the same, but Clyde still decides to detonate the bomb, so he dials the detonation cell phone. It turns out that they have moved the bomb to be under Clyde's bed, and Clyde tries to hide in his secret tunnel, but Dunnigan seals the door from the other side. As Dunnigan and Nick run away, Clyde finally accepts his fate, and the bomb explodes, destroying the whole cell block. In the movie's ending, Nick finally attends his daughter's cello performance, which he had always missed before. Law enforcement and the legal system are not perfect, and sometimes bad people don't get to face the consequences of their actions. Although his ways are extreme, Clyde teaches a lesson on how bad the legal system has failed him. What do you think of his decision? Let us know what you think in the comment section. Don't forget to subscribe and like the video. Thank you for watching, and as always, see you next time.